Ich freue mich riesig, Yvonne Adiambo Ovur anmoderieren zu dürfen. Sie ist genialische Autorin, sie lebt und arbeitet in Nairobi und 2006 stand sie mit einem Schlag im literarischen äh, Rampenlicht, als sie den Kane Prize for African Writing gewann. Seitdem hat sie erheblich dazu beigetragen, die Sichtbarkeit der afrikanischen literarischen Kunst und Kultur auf globalem Niveau zu stärken und gilt zu Recht als eine der wichtigsten Stimmen der zeitgenössischen Literatur Afrikas. Ivana Diambo Awur is a multi-award winning author. She was born in Kenya and lives and works in Nairobi. In 2006, she was in the literary, literary spotlight in one fellow, fell, <laughs> in Wolf Fell Swoop when she won the Kane Prize for African Writing. Since then, she has contributed significantly to raising the visibility of African literature on a global level and is rightly considered one of the most important voices in contemporary African literature. Thank you. Welcome. Yvonne Adiambo Uvo. To all dignitaries, um, honorable guests, everyone present here, our conference delegates, the Global South uh, Study Center organizers, friends, my dear friends, there are ma many of you here. And to, I was asked to acknowledge the outstanding listeners, uh, those who may be uh, outside. So you're part, of, you're part of this process, all of you. As I said, it's good to be back here in Cologne. Um, I wanted uh, to dedicate, initially I wanted to dedicate this session to the proud people and the nation of Sudan, those who have been turned into grieving exiles because in the words of poet Was and Shea, through no fault of their own, home has become the mouth of a shark. And then uh, we heard the news of uh, Professor Ama Ataidu's death yesterday. And she's one of the great trees um, that sheltered so many um, with her vision, with her thoughts. So um, it would be amiss of me if I did not also seek to honor her in this moment. So I'll start this reflection, I'll just jump into the presentation. I'll start with a reflection on context before posing some questions. I will then uh, look at two, three flashpoint areas, economy, security, and story, and then pose more questions. I have woven an elegy for our earth in this talk that is also interspersed with uh, AI-generated images. And I, I think I may have gone a little bit overboard. It was so much fun. Uh, some of these are <laughs> may have gone just a little bit, <laughs> but please bear with it. First, I do not presume to speak for the 54-plus nations and the diaspora that make up the current sense of Africa. The Africa to which I refer is not the Euro-American site of fantasy or projection. There is no subbing of the Sahara in my Africa. That to which I speak is home, the idea and the ideal that is under the custody of a most splendid, long, enduring people. This is not an Africa Renaissance lecture or the anointing of an emerging Africa middle class that has always existed despite the tall tales of social development peddlers and their ilk. Also, let us agree to consign that bubblegum cheerleading chant, Africa rising to a fiery end, be gone, I say. As for future and the future in this talk, it is not a life at the far end of some linear trajectory. The future has roots in what we think of as the past. It crafts a story in what we live as present. Once upon a time, we, we used to say in a lead up to a tale, it could also gesture to a time in tomorrow. I use future to gesture to our human and African longing for meaning, purpose and relevance in this world. A hope of good 
life, truth, and beauty when we wake up tomorrow. I imagine future as an element of time and being, an active entity that marks the Earth's march towards a destination that some subject specialists assign different names and possibilities. I enter our theme from our shared place of reality, a collective of figurative frogs. Did you know the collective noun for frog is not? It's appropriate for all of us, the entangled ones. Sitting inside a slow, simmering cauldron, as we stare, equally entertained and bemused at the thundering approach of the horsemen of the apocalypse. <coughs> what a time this is of existential and dramatic battles off and for worldviews and mythologies. What a mess. What an opportunity. The season of flux is marked by the reluctant retreat of old powers from our worlds, uncertainty, disintegration, as established systems and structures give way, for they can no longer shelter or hold our humanity in its complex realities, in its emerging possibilities. This is a season rich with emergences of imagining other ways of being, other alliances, allegiances and connections, job and work changes, shifting power centers, challenges to entrenched political and governance ideologies, technological competitions, a need for humbler relationships with nature. This is a season for new metaphors and archetypes, a time of epics undergirded by the march of power, the march to power of some of the Earth's older civilizations. The Earth stage is set, unfortunately, for the once imagined twilight of battling gods. Now our beautiful Earth hurtles towards a chasm of our making. And when I say our, I do not mean that we share equal blame for the disorder. And it is infuriating to me that Africa is on board a doomsday train and cannot jump off. Let me digress a little to the younger generation here. There are not enough apologies that anyone can make to you to make up for the ashes and smokes. We, the older generation, are determined you must inherit. Assuming you survive the bloody wars we are designing for you to immolate yourselves in for all our dumb causes. We have immersed our beautiful humanity in a pandemic of fear and threat, of constant bad, sad news, livelihood crisis, credit crunches, the weaponization of migration, state-sanctioned land grabbing, cyber warfare, neurocognitive violence, wars generated to blow countries back into the Stone Age so that a few building contractors can move in to make profits. Loss of lives, of biodiversity, of faith, trust, and hope. Manufacturing atrocities, unknown contents in closet biowarfare closets. Human slaughters over which we look away. Regime changes by any means possible. Chemical warfare, biodiversity losses, criminali criminalization of suffering, instrumentalization of shame, exploding energy costs, a looming global economic crash, loss of glaciers, the death of bees, the psychic anguish of peoples, a loss of a moral compass, uncontrollable technological forces, a crisis of purpose and meaning, capricious gods who have purposed to turn our humanity mad. Climate crisis? That is a mirror of our existential crisis with its signature chronic loneliness, chemical dependency, intolerance, cynicism, and nihilism, a separation from community and nature, machine addiction, a spiritual void, and a tragic glamorization of the opting out of life. We fetishize terror and horror. And we are spurred to rejoice at the return of a nuclear rhetoric, idiotic words, 
intending our demise. We cheer the encirclements of nations, especially of China, the target of a future war. We endure puerile uh, us versus theisms, and few men and women speak up for diplomacy, dignity, negotiation, compromise, conflict prevention, mediation, and peace choosing. Restraint emissaries are labeled as cowards, traitors, and whataboutists. Rules defined by the Geneva Convention are eroded. Xenophobia and Russophobia are now virtues with which to signal, as were, as were Islamophobia and negrophobia. Well done, world. Soon enough, we might even get to answer the question, does the world end with a whimper or a bang? Most of us from the rest of the world live a baseline wariness of anything that the Western media proposes. For we have tolerated and excused rabid, a rabid atrocity outrage and consent, consent manufacturing, propaganda and stereotyping that are then deployed to justify mass murder, ideological reprogramming, and barbaric military missions that are hemorrhaging our humanity without overt consequences to instigators, liars, and perpetrators. An instrumentalization of imagination, story, and image pile on the wounds of our humanity and our world. The gap between the rest and the West is a growing chasm, justifiably. Attitudes and emotions harden as we shut down even the few spaces of difficult but neutral and mutual listening, of silent attention to the deepest cries of others. Triggered, some of us moan. Uncomfortable, we sigh, as if we have all suddenly become snowflakes. In Africa, we endure with declining patience the sounds of those who are far too devoted to a simplistic, ignorant, opportunistic, tribal, pathological, parasitic, and paternalist, paternalistic engagement with us, who then design policies and approaches from a persistent fantasy that endures in their thick heads. I get it. To have to relinquish a supremacist self-image would generate an existential crisis. We do not care, and we're obviously destined not to get along. And now, we can afford to be indifferent. Apart from some of our lackey leaders, mostly the general African population is already looking within and or eastwards, where the sun of another life rises. The march to multipolarity is inexorable. As Singapore's former Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, George Yeo notes, whether we like it or not, the world is going to change. And the multipolar world, to me, is in the cards. It's already been born. It's growing up. A change for us is as good as a rest. <coughs> Speaking bluntly, whatever comes next cannot be as diabolical debilitating, dehumanizing, plundering, humiliating, horrific, and evil as what the last five, five centuries have been for most of the world. As the rest test other configurations of reality, the promise of multipolarism bodes very well for the ambitions of a re-energized and re-imagined Africa. We sense the fin de siècle civilizational shift the center cannot hold. We see the ex-center's overcompensatory militarism and how it now flings itself hither thither like the proverbial crazed bull in the China, the pun is intended, shop. Now, because of this futile, futile attempt to hold back the tide, a quarter of our world is orienting itself to a war of the ages. About that war of worlds, the hegemon protective types are even trying to lure our humanity into a Gotadamarum. The world is seduced into forgetting that in the event 
of a nuclear war, you, I, the children, Bosco the dog and Fifi the cat shall be incinerated. An undermined and defanged United Nations has little to say about all this. Its future is also easy to predict. It is on the road that led to the sight of the ghosts of the League of Nations. The debasing of global institutions to serve biased interests is corruption by another name, corruption that now informs our own cynicism and loss of trust in one another. Anyway, I predict two outcomes. One, one is the bloody entrenchment of a multipolar, pluriversal world that faces eastward. The second, a post amagedon Gotadamarung or post Gotadamarung crafted from the ruins of our world that is also multipolar and eastward facing. A less likely third possibility is a Deus ex machina event. But I want to say Gotadamarung is not an African word, neither should its ruins be our portion. But given the emerging dispensation, as we turn our gaze into African worlds and future making, I want to propose some guiding questions. What and who is Africa now? Where are its boundaries? What are its topographies? What have we become? What are our plural identities? What does multipolarism mean for Africa? What refreshing stories, ideas and questions can we conjure to give meaning to our context today? What relationships do we need? What is a collective African philosophical matrix upon which we can raise a future? As custodians of the world's bounties, whether material or biological, what responsibilities must we wield to guarantee a secure future for ourselves and the children to come? What and acknowledge strengths, advantages, and powers have we gained from living with a 500-year-old minotaur? What is its weakness? How do we release what still haunts us? How do we release the unrequited forces from the unresolved age of European atrocity in Africa so we, we can cross the threshold into our emerging world unburdened? What metaphors and archetypes can we deploy now to reinvigorate our imagination of our future? What does it mean for us to live abundantly? What is our multi-generational vision story? What story can we conjure to project ourselves into the future? Who stands in our light and must be moved? What is our relationship with the cosmos? What is the cosmology upon which we can build our world? Not just for us, but for everyone else. What skills can we leverage uniquely to outmatch the forces of this emerging age? What must we leave behind? What languages do we use to populate a story of us? What does it mean for us to be human and African now? What then does the humanity of others mean for us? Now, once upon a time, I imagined the convergence of Africans as active protagonists of a future world, playing roles that inform a life-restoring civilizational impulse, leveraging their splendid peoples to live out a reality of a freshly rehumanized world. I see an Africa that is a global hub for resource-based innovations and manufacturing, one where our historical connections with Asia and the Middle East are reconstituted, an Africa that profits greatly from being the home of resources that feed, fuel, and fire the world. An Africa where BRICS plus systems and ideas have consigned the post-World War II institutions and structures to the fogs of history, and where the shrines of nauseating pity and min misery industry, some of you call it social development, are burnt to ash. 
For over 400 years, our ancient continent has not been without intense pressures from still powerful forces who boldly factor Africa's resources into their own future making without our consent to this day. To overcome this, what, how do we organize ourselves? We, I know what I do know is that we quickly need to cohere around a common story, vision, strategy, and plan for ourselves and then for the rest of the world and then for the galaxies. The lack of an African self-myth, a collective self-myth, a binding story, and please not Wakanda, that is linked to an immense multi-century, multi-generational transcendent, multi-universe aspiration. <clears throat> One that requires a fiery reimagination of ourselves, the world and the galaxies. That lack make us susceptible to being blasted left, right and center by others more potent stories and all the blowing winds of time. Yet, realistically, hobbled militarily, economically and politically, and yes, some of this is also self-inflicted, as a people and continent, how can we move? How can we shift dimensions? How do we create time to dream a story of us? If I had my way, I would demand that all the nations of the world, the West in particular, delete our contacts. I would summon all African peoples home. And secure inside the continent, I would build a Trump fence around our world. Yes. Leave us alone would be posted as signs in many languages. And we would use the space to breathe. To just breathe. Later, we would talk over shared meals. But first, we would breathe before we embark on the sacred task of crafting a truthful, meaningful cartography of our being. How we need new maps of us. Our African political independence, manipulatable and malleable, was always less threatening to the world than any efforts to secure our economic autonomy. And we are still rigged we're still locked into a massively rigged trade economic system that requires our economic weakness in order for it to sustain itself. Yet we have entered a time in the world where gold buying has ramped up, de-dollarization and de-westernization are a trend, and the green economy, most of the resources of which are in Africa, is the future. But what future can we seize when we cannot even use our own resources to pay for our dreams? Resources others use very ably to craft their version of the future, their version of reality. Are we prepared to subject every deal and agreement in existence in our world to a review linked to essential questions like how does this serve us? Who benefits? most from this. How do we get to determine and control the price of our diamonds, our coffee, our platinum? The element, as I said, the fulcrum of the future, of future global competitiveness is no longer oil, but the green energy metals, coltan, copper, nickel, manganese. And Africa, again, is chief custodian of all these so what would it take to move the centers of production and value addition to source sites within Africa and under, and under African governance and management? How do we think this through as we take advantage of this time when the world as we know it is also coming apart at its seams? And the suffocating 500-year-old wealth-grabbing scaffolding that imposed itself into our story our worlds, our horizons is destined to fall. There will be casualties. We shall not be enjoined in the collapse. Oh no, it is not fate if signs have presented themselves to us as they have. And if we succumb this time as our forebears did before, it will be because of our willful stupidity, incompetence and neglect. 
And yes, economic aut autonomy is our fiercest battleground if we are to win the game of futures. Most nations of the world design their wealth on our bounties, from our bounties. Those nations will fight, fight a hundred times hard to retain the status quo. Our world building project demands that we secure economic autonomy and not with the rules that are in place. To get there, among many things, we must enshrine cross-boundary intra-African business, travel, education, and business collaborations. We need to trade, interact, and meet first within and among ourselves. We need to leverage a common currency. We need to develop a common code of connecting and longing. Our Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is a step towards a glowing future. It's a most powerful seed. This agreement that would turn our continent into the world's largest free trade zone. We should have all rushed aboard that ship. But I notice even in this conference, very few refer to AF, the, the, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And all our efforts, as usual, are disparate. Our preoccupations so many that we fail to recognize the presence and the beckon of the Grand Horizons that are literally standing before us. African autonomy in its security and safety is another major realm of contestation. In February, South Africa, Russia and China held a naval military exercise off South Africa's east coast from Durban to Richards Bay. A necessary pissing contest. Yet. Not once have our nations, not once have we conducted joint military exercises, even if it was just for fun. Yet, as our forebears discovered, despite their military craftsmanships and brilliance, the future to be secured must include a robust and muscular vision for the defense of the whole, not only the parts of the continent. To own surprising and unexpected technology and to think, for God's sake, to think as a great power in planning means to think. And that first through the protection and preservation of what is theirs, their people, their places. And we the rest have good reasons to be concerned, nay frightened, of the current psychotic meltdowns over China's meteoric, meteoric rise into the realm of superpower. Although neutrality and non-alignment must be our emphatic African ice anthem, the wounded behemoths will be shopping around for bodies to use for odious sacrificial fires. We have been here before. This is how my late great uncle Ojan Jem found himself killing strangers as a sniper for the British army in Burma and losing precious companions whose bodies were never repatriated home. We, the rest, also suspect that the West would prefer to blow up the entire Earth in a suicidal rage rather than settle into the ongoing process of the decay of their overlong hegemony. And today, we listen to nuclear-infused temper tantrums, vile messaging, disinformation, and neurotic breakdowns over a culture that has squandered the hold they had on the world. Who are mortally jealous of another country's emergence, dramatis personae gallop around the world in the drama with a trio of Trojan horses neighing democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, the latter repurposed as the rules-based order. Mediocre entities pop up here, there, and everywhere and pontificate, especially on my continent, about right and wrong, even as their born-again neo-barbarians package a satanic pettiness as a call to freedom. And they shore up nuclear bomb-resistant doomsday bankers, bunkers. But what is our stake as an Africa reflecting on or desiring to inscribe ourselves into a living future. 
Yes, we can dream of a war-free future, but we can only get there if we are powerful enough and frightening enough to tell those who want war, bugger off and mean it. What does this imply? To accept that right now the entire continent is undefended. Do we imagine that third-hand weapons our nation spends all its resources on will work in a stranger's battlefield? Ha! Huh. But we still need our distinct and concealed technological masteries. We need to enlist the mind's energy and the imagination of our creative and inventive cohorts to prepare battle scenarios and invent new tools and weapons to reflect on an, an ideal African future security infrastructure. We need to ask how to get strong. How do we get strong enough? How can we get strong enough to move alien forces out of our world and continent and take charge of our own safety and security? How do we converge to end our continent's proxy wars? How do we then prioritize peace and cooperation and start the Herculean task of mitigating human suffering? A third point of contention, the generation of narratives, images and consciousness. And the generation of these images, narratives, African narratives, images and consciousness is essential, actually is, is the pillar and post of future making. We have, alas, endured for far too long an array of half-educated asses who still believe that the life and history of our ancient continent began only when they rocked up, centuries later than everyone else, as vile and violent predators, speaking of entrenched delusions. But we will not get mad. We will ride this new epoch hard and get even. We must. Narrative states, did you read the news today? Do you attend to which stories are told of humanity? What is believable? Do you get the feeling that we have been turned into objects upon which invented content from insidious information wars, disinformation campaigns are merely projected? We suffer the sullying of our public knowledge, our life experience, and sense of our environment and each other. Truthiness, not truth. Fake news intoned American legend Donald Trump. Stories created to stimulate hatred that are ahistorical, weaponize tribalism, valorize saviorism, promote fear and punish alternative opinions. And if anyone is not singing the same projected song, the deployment of cancel culture. Yet this devastating behavior has undergirded girded our world for over 400 years. The heresy of dehumanization, justifying all kinds of evil, is not new. Supremacist thinking depends on this ceaseless battle against our human will, imagination, agency, that mocks our yearning for truth and turns virtue signaling into a badge of morality. The aim is to colonize the imagination. Neurocognitive wars, we are now being told, or, in truth, the sanctioned abuse of human conscious and consciousness. This, arguably, is our most strategic and most important battle front. How do we counter it? How do we salvage reality? With a more compelling story, built on indisputable truth, and transcendent vision. This is a reality-shaping undertaking. What must we do to summon an incarnational story of us and the world that returns feral freedom to the human spirit, one rooted in timelessness and hopefulness? We need our hands and visions on strategic and imaginative decks to raise metaphorical sails for battleship Future Africa. The present intra-European war is also quite revelatory. It has obliged many of us to interrogate the scope and limits of sovereignty. We now softly ask questions about autonomy, vassalage, and agency, and question the world's commitment to the Nuremberg's resolutions 
I meet European intimates who, forced into wakefulness, suddenly understand that matters of national sovereignty are not restricted to the global south. And I have to bite my tongue to stop myself from muttering to them, a luta continua. Everything is in flux, uncertainty reigns, old worlds and their rules crumble. What's in it for us? For Africa to make sense of these times and its players, we need seers and storytellers who wield fresh metaphors, who summon old archetypes that can carry the energies of this age. Projecting 18th, 19th and 20th century ghosts into the now is unhelpful. Old tropes equals wrong conclusions. Yet this is a space of opportunity for African world makers. A chance to enter the gap, seize ter territory by naming this time. Assign undeniable and meaningful values to the reality we are confronted with today. Wor word making, word giving, that is how to populate the future. Lessons acquired from recent global events confirm that when the chips are down, our continent is wholly on its own. Now we know. So we cannot afford to sit out this time. Others have moved ahead and delivered unexpected rapprochements, coalitions and regional formations, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Syria. We need to repopulate the oceanic ful fulcrum of the emerging future, the Swahili seas, Afrasian waters, Indian Ocean. These are our waters. We are the only continent with a stake in these waters, by the way, who are excluded from all conversations and schemes about what old ad adversaries are now calling the Indo-Pacific. I insist that we should call it Swahili Seas, just because. Just to piss people off. Those waters are ours, and they are key to future formation. What does Africa want from and of these, our Swahili seas, our Ziwaku? Do you know? More questions. What would African world hegemony look like? What is its premise? What is its epic story? How do we leverage it? How do we domesticate the power of our resources to secure our wildest ambitions? How do we also exercise the stench of, de of a dehumanizing cult that draws its power from caricaturing our essence? We have searched for a story of the world we can inhabit in intimacy and freedom and truth and beauty. What would it take to write one for ourselves? So where is the fresh grammar of us? Where are our piercing questions? Where is the inferno of our imagination? The wildest and intentional reclamation of our joy, our wisdom, our grandeur, our strength, our power. What informs your and my African ideal? Who are our people? Yet in dreaming for ourselves, we must also dare to dream for the whole world, for the galaxies, for the earth, for the seas, if we want to realize our transcendent self. Listen, we have the distinct privilege of being custodians of a fascinating new generation who have been born intrinsically trans-African. They look within and are Africa-focused in a way many never dared to dream about before. They speak easily of African love and loveliness, showcasing our beauty and do this for themselves. They wear their plural identities on their sleeves and, heart, and hearts. They have liberated themselves from trying to fit into the limits of others' imagination of us. No, but they do not airbrush our wounds either. They converse with these and seek to clear them so that they, these can become portals through which another type of light shines through. I follow them on YouTube and Instagram. They travel within the African continent as tourists, witnesses, creators, friend seekers. They generate African content from within Africa and then broadcast these stories without mediators. You might soon hear from them or not. They do not engage with what does not interest them. Best of all, they know that, that Earth is also ours. 
It's also here for us, that we the Africans are also its precious custodians, that the galaxies are also ours and the stars, and that we can dream and desire them for them. And with that African generation already born, we too may dare to experiment with sculpting, writing, painting, filming, singing, a planetary role as a five millennia epic, or make it 10 millennia epic, centered on and in the continent. To imagine it, script it, sing it, make a graphic novel about it, paint it, speak it into the dreams of babies just conceived. That transcending dream will find us in the hour that we can lay a hold of and commit to befriend our depths, our deaths, shadows, and our most innermost worlds. We cannot build our future upon others' philosophies, epistemologies, mythologies, or their stories of us. To get close to our bones, we must embark on the repair and restoration of the infrastructure of our souls and spirits to re rehabilitate the shattered internal relationships within our nations and around our continent. We were not only betrayed by strangers, but we have also fatally betrayed one another. Our silences can no longer hold. If we want to live, we must talk through our wounds to one another so we can design the passageways of the future as a people who have chosen wholeness. Moral injuries, inherited traumas, we still must take firm yet humble steps to reclaim one another as individuals, as Africans, and people of shared descent. To borrow from Resma Menachem's words, for the sake of the, we do this for the sake of the children to come to salvage the future, we must metabolize our pain and heal our trauma. We must. So who are we now to each other, we shall ask. We also need to let go of waiting for the gesture of acknowledgement or absolution from the beneficiaries of those who devastated our worlds, who stole our patrimonies, and dehumanized our race, whose descendants today perform monkey dances in stadiums when our gladiators are playing, who will not recognize the depth of their depravities or what it meant to betray and degrade human dignity, decency, and loveliness. That should not preoccupy us for too much longer our more urgent and strategically useful work in this time is inhabiting our incarnational selves, being receptive to our life, our wonder, and amplifying the privilege of our endurance of worlds with joy, with love, beauty, truth, passion, and power. You see, despite everything, despite those 500 years, we are still here. And we carry immense worlds within us. And the future aches for our lucid dreaming, for our courage. You see, China, you see, realized this as much for itself. And their success, as you can see, has disarrayed the old, tedious world. China delivered for themselves a coherent transgenerational story backed by their own resources one that responded to their own deepest longings, despite their humiliation and degradation. Where is our Africa version? Where is our story that will move our billion souls into immense wealth and confidence and certainty and do this within a generation? Where is it? Yes, China challenges us, the continent, the most, and that's good. In the late 70s, Kenya was donating tea to China after an earthquake and sending development workers through Western NGOs to work with Chinese farmers. And yet within a relatively short time and without war, that country chose to co-opt its people to create another script for itself and to, de de to deliver another future for itself and the world and even the moon and even Mars. 
It unsettles me and I hope it unsettles you. I really hope it makes you restless. As an African collective, can we surpass this? Damn, yes. Why? Because we have more of everything. Malawi Malawian economist and visionary Tandika Mkandawire reminded us we possess the most powerful of raw materials. Our collective creativity in its diversity, in its energy, in its ideas and imagination. Our demographics are our, are our treasury. So what must we do to create an environment that will support the release and play of the imagination of our millions? How do we invite power, truth, creativity, goodness and beauty and love to overcome our inherited shame, anger and failed quests for justice? How do we practice calling and naming and describing ourselves beautifully and all the time? These are some of the bricks for the roads, paths, bridges, net, bridges, networks, and systems into our homes and hearts where the future waits for us. We need cross-boundary fast trains, open sky planes, and the removal of intra-African visa regiments. We need privileged entry into Africa for the Afro diaspora. We need to visit one another with ease, live with love, fight and argue with one another as we build platforms of remembrance, of solidarity and meaning together. We need to generate a shared language, co-produce myths and stories and songs, create indus industries, cultivate our lands, go to school together, start businesses, guard our livestock and wildlife, rebuild our world, engage a contemporary African gestalt to stimulate our moral imagination, our ethos of the future. We need to turn to each other often and ask, what are we meant for? What are you meant for? What am I meant for? What is our purpose? What do we love? What is our good? We need some wild philosophical and theological workouts to push us into the bowels of our cosmological senses that will deliver to us the deep narratives, names, that will also appease our ancestors and shelter our voids, our wounds, our ghosts, our phantoms, and also our loves and desires while generating an ethical imagination that coheres us, that is coherent. Inside of this, we can look again at the faces of our sorrows and horrors with peace. They have formed us. We cannot remove or deny them. Out of the depths, emergence. And we will exorcise the lingering terror of our destruction. We can also audit our triumphs, the elixir of surviving a diabolically hostile ecology for this long, for we must have acquired some unusual powers from a 400-year sojourn in the underworld. Yes, we live the resonant anguish of our ancestors. We are bruised by a desire for, our, for an unreconciled past that neither expected nor withstood the, repug the repugnant evil and horror that disintegrated our worlds. And we are secretly furious that the leaders of, of that time had not prepared to counter the world's malign forces of that time. And we are afraid of learning the contours of the abyss which opened beneath our ancestors' feet. The abyss we inhabit often only in our imagination. Stained and changed by profound evil, a people cursed by intimate absences of choked up sorrows that suffocate our breathing, who dare not ask themselves, what have we become? Yet how do we recover? For recover we must. How do we retrieve our sacred and charged goods moldering in foreign stores? How do we disarm evil and re-emerge into a reality where love, forgiveness, healing, and transformation abound? And we must dialogue with our demons and phantoms and phased. Why? Because we are still here, that is why. We are the ones who survived an apocalypse. This is not about excusing evil or the past. It's a gesture of love to and for ourselves and the future. How do we deploy our consciousness to integrate this time? We are already a transmuted people, able to wield a, wield a gift of vision to build a bulwark against chaos. Future-making is a colossal undertaking. 
but we have the power to dream worlds into being, for we are also a transtemporal people. So what steps must we take to inhabit this self and speak from within it? And when we do, shall we speak to one another in the languages of our humus, a language just for us? How then can we gang up undetected to remove malevolent forces that bind us that diminish our length, breadth, depth, age, name, and being. Our approach must be one of unabashed self-privileging, self-prioritizing, and asking, is this for us? We need private Afro hubs in numerous places to pour again over the words, ideas, and images of our various prophets and martyrs, the living and the ancestral. Lumumba Cabral, Fanon, Biko, I do Mboya or God, all of them and more, a pantheon of extraordinary patron saints and martyrs, and connect their dreams with those of a new generation. We have the blueprints of the future in hand. It is time. We have struggled so long to fit into a world now in decline that gave us so little and forced us through a thousand small humiliations into a perpetual defense of our humanity. We can stop now and look within for our own faces. Draw these out. It is time. It is time. Recently, in the artificial intelligence news frenzy, a journalist friend worried about Africa being bypassed. A gifted Kenya technonaut, Faris Karioki, he, he gave a very laconic reply. He said, ultimately, all progress is a factor of human capital development. Africa will have 50% of the world's babies. We will be fine. We will be fine. We know it in our marrow. Those questions, narrative threads, and images that pertain to the future and our role in its formation. The future is also looking for us for its marvelous other dreams. In this time of flux, we must occupy, inhabit, populate the crafting of a powerful stories for ourselves, for humanity, for the earth, for the galaxies, for the stars. Reality is born out of the stories humanity tells itself and then chooses to turn these, the stories into life. Imagine, imagine, imagine. As custodians of the Africa idea, the ideal, we dare and we can stride into the arena of time, that an, in, uh, an arena of time, with a vision of an in, in, in an epoch of incandescent African suns shining within each and every single one of us. But come what may, we will be fine. Once upon a time, inscribed into grand constellations. Africa, the future, it is so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne Adiambo Ubuwa. Thank you for this strong and powerful message, this keynote, um, that leaves the question behind. African futures all around. Is it a vision of African future from within, for and from Africa and Africans? Or is it an idea or opinion on how African future looks like from all around, from outside? Thank you for leaving us with this critical, concerning, but yet also necessary thought that we need to digest on. Thank you. I also want to say thank you to the Jutta Vogel Stiftung of the University of Cologne that financed this keynote. I would like to say thank you to all the organizers, to all the hardworking people behind the scenes, and to all of you that came here today, tonight, to celebrate the opening of the ICAS conference. Also, the evening does not end now. There's going to be the Africa Cologne Festival 
afterwards and it will also open its doors. But within the break, the University of Cologne will invite all of you for a little drink and some snacks. And if you brought a lot of hunger and appetite, there are also going to be some food stands outside where you can buy some West and East African food. Um, and we just pray you please to come out quickly and leave on the right side so that there will not be uh, too much noise, too much uh, noise level. Um, thank you for opening also the next chapter of the program, which is the African Futures All Around and the Africa Loan Festival. Those programs that we spoke about earlier um, are going to be also for the civil society, free to everyone to join from the 30th of May till the 11th of June. And so you're all welcome. <laughs>